This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com slash brownTable and use promo code brownTable for not only 70% off NordVPN, which is only $3.49 a month, but for an additional month free. Okay, we assume your superhero might be extra strong, or might be able to fly or run as fast as a comet. But unless you care about the superhero's personal life, you're just reading a shallow story. Just because a person has a superpower doesn't mean he might not have the same personal problems that you or I might have. Maybe he doesn't have enough money. Maybe he has a family problem. So the superhero isn't just one or two dimensional. You want a three dimensional superhero who lives and breathes and worries and experiences things just the way you and I do. You probably all remember, but there was once a time when Spider-Man reigned supreme as the most popular Marvel superhero. Actually, maybe the most popular superhero in general. The 2000s were a great year to be a Spider-Man fan, and in 2008, when I was only nine years old, one of the greatest interpretations of Spider-Man debuted. Yeah, you read the title, you know what it is. Stop me if you've heard this one before. MCU Spider-Man isn't Spider-Man. There's a lot of critique and debate on why MCU Spider-Man isn't a good interpretation of the character, and there's also talk of how the Raimi films are only loved because of nostalgia, but a statement that a lot of Spider-Man fans can agree with is that the spectacular Spider-Man did a, well, spectacular job at developing the character for TV in a way that respected the source material. A fact that a lot of people don't know is that Spider-Man graduates high school in issue 28 of The Amazing Spider-Man. A lot of people have a misconception that Spider-Man is meant to be a high schooler, a kid, but he's actually been a college student and an adult most of the time. But the spectacular Spider-Man show manages to take advantage of its particular setting, as well as pay a lot of attention to the character of Spider-Man, as well as the life of Peter Parker. That's right, Peter Parker. Not Spider-Man. For little kids, you have Spider-Man. He's full of bright colors, he's funny, he's charming, and is visually a sight to behold. I still remember watching Spider-Man 2 in theaters. That shit was amazing. Pizza time. But for adults, Spider-Man is a mirror image of ourselves, the struggles we go through in our daily lives. For those that aren't kids, Spider-Man is the most relatable superhero because he's us. When writing a superhero, or a superpowered character, you can of course have them be super powerful and fun to look at, but there has to be something behind that character. It can't be something that exists just to advance the plot, the character has to have dilemmas and struggles to make them interesting. And Peter Parker is human. And again, I tried to keep it realistic. In order not to make him a typical hero, I made him an average guy who was kind of unpopular. He was sort of a nerd. Uh, the kids didn't like him. They thought he was a bookworm. He didn't have enough money. He had to support his old aunt. He was shy and so forth. And it turned out he was somebody that the readers could relate to. So he became very successful. What's so special about the spectacular Spider-Man's Peter Parker is that he's exactly how Stan Lee described him. He's clumsy, studious, and his money problems. And those character traits aren't just there to make us relate, but it's to help us understand the character and understand the choices the character makes. In The Spectacular Spider-Man, we see Peter having to struggle with the simple problem of having to get home by 10. And he worries his poor aunt, who he doesn't want to worry because of all the shit she's dealing with. And as the first episode shows, less than five minutes in... We're almost out of money. We'll manage. And please, not a word of this to Peter. <coughs> hey, Aunt May, how's the most- Super powerful, super brief scene. Peter is worried about his aunt, but doesn't want to show his worry because that'll make her worry more. He knows that he has to be her rock at a critical moment in her life. Peter Parker doesn't want to burden the person he cares most in the world, and something so simple drives his actions in the series. From wanting to earn money to support his aunt, to then accidentally creating his own job. A proposal. I think I can get you pictures, photos, of Spider-Man in action. <laughs> What the Bugle needs is photos of Spider-Man in action. What the fuck? To then getting pictures of Spider-Man, which means he earns money, but in doing so, he loses the trust of his friends. Bro, 
You ditched the antidote effort to win a contest. I can't trust you. You're fired. The key about Peter Parker is that his life is real, not shitty. Peter Parker isn't supposed to be poor and barely scraping by and constantly worrying about the people in his life because he's supposed to be a depressing character. He's doing all these things because he's a real character. And again, Peter Parker is human. Spider-Man stories aren't written to make his life shitty so we can all bask in the shittiness. His stories are written to be like ours, full of little problems that become big problems, but some of them resolve, and that gives us moments of joy. Spider-Man stories are supposed to be about how even though life is hard and things can get bad, people are still good, and life can still be rewarding, and that we shouldn't lose faith. Nothing went as planned today, but I'm still Spider-Man, and I still have this amazing person watching out for me. Tell me there's something better. Go ahead. Try. But let's remember that even though Peter Parker is Spider-Man, the character should be treated as two characters, with problems arising from the Spider-Man side and the Peter Parker side, which can at times tangle with each other. And that's when things get really interesting. This seems to be something that the creative team of the show really delved into. We put together a basic plan for the season, and we work out the basic subplots, and that's what all the cards are up on the board. Pink cards are Peter Parker subplots, and the blue cards are Spider-Man subplots. And we go through the cards, but we may pull cards off, or we say, no, we're going to move this down to this episode, move this up, or whatever we need to do to come up with what's the theme for the episode. And it's not just Peter Parker that's dipped in realism. It's interesting because one would expect a show set in high school to have corny dialogue and have the characters acting like infants, but no, the show is incredibly mature for being a show aimed for kids. And while it never gets too dark, it never gets successively lighthearted. Heck, even Peter's relationship with Liz happens naturally. It isn't that Liz is just like Peter like Gwen. There's an actual challenge to make Liz be interested in Peter. But intelligently, she falls for Peter's honesty, integrity, and confidence. And it isn't out of nowhere, it has ground to stand on. And on honesty, we fully understand the person Peter is more so than usual because we actually hear his thoughts. Peter goes full anime mode and narrates his life, and it leads to incredible moments in which we listen to him battling with his personal demons and responsibilities and hear him reasoning with himself. It leads to amazing dialogue like this. I never asked for these powers. I never knew it would mean a bashed up hand, a hard 9 p.m. curfew, no job, and friends who all think I'm scum. This all resembles comic book thought balloons, and I can't help but think that this was integrated into the show to pay homage to the fact that Spider-Man is constantly thinking to himself as he lives his life. Easiest decision I ever made. I gave all our characters a lot of thought balloons, where you knew what the character was thinking. Now, I did that to a great extent. Hardly anybody else ever did in comics. But it gave such another dimension to our char characters, because if you know, know what somebody is thinking, you really know the person. But thanks to the webhead, Kurt's cured, and Billy gets his father back. Spidey stays because Spidey's needed. For now, anyway. I wanted to talk about just how incredible the first three episodes of The Spectacular Spider-Man are. In the first episode alone, we meet nearly all the main characters in the season. Peter is a normal kid who has financial problems, and he starts conflating Peter Parker and Spider-Man, when only Spider-Man is cool, and Peter Parker is still seen as puny Parker. Lucky you didn't try this with my girl, Parker. Back off, Flash. I won't be your punching bag anymore. We get to meet Flash Thompson and his crew, along with Gwen Stacy, a girl as talented as Peter, and Harry Osborn, who lacks affection from his father. Peter gets all of Norman's affection, which in turn leads Harry to do very bad things later on. At ESU, working with Kurt Connors. Connors, huh? Quite an opportunity. I suppose you were considered for the honor, Harry. And these scenes aren't just there to set the stage, these characters constantly morph and improve or degrade. Every single thing in the series isn't just there to pay homage to Spider-Man comics, but they're there to actively change the story. And a major theme of the first season, and in most Spider-Man stories in general, is the dichotomy between Peter Parker and Spider-Man. And the spectacular Spider-Man perfectly captures both the good and bad that being Spider-Man brings Peter. And one of the most powerful, cathartic moments of the entire series is when Peter accepts that even though Spider-Man and Peter Parker are two sides of him, they still make up one man. He remembers why he fights, and who he's fighting for, and defeats the symbiote which embodies how greedy, egoistic, and selfish Peter could become. 
Peter Parker's entire world broke when he lost his Uncle Ben, something the show constantly highlights but never drowns us with. It's always important to remind us why the hero does what he does and why he's fighting, because if not, then why would we care if he's fighting or not? Peter Parker isn't someone who does things for himself, he does what's right. And if he ever does something selfish, it's likely unwittingly. And if the writers are smart, Peter will face repercussions for his actions or Peter will blame himself. Take a look at episode two. Electro is an incredibly compelling villain who just wants his life back. And Spider-Man goes out of his way to embarrass him publicly. Recognizing his mistake, Spider-Man tries to reason with Electro but gets fried. Look, I messed up before, but now I really want to help. You want to hold my hand? <laughs> The spectacular Spider-Man does this constantly for all its prominent villains. They all have depth and reasons to be who they are. They're not just obstacles for Spider-Man to overcome, they're there to further Peter Parker's journey into becoming someone more responsible, a more mature hero, into becoming the greatest hero of them all. I know a lot of this video has been about what makes Spider-Man Spider-Man, and I guess that's kind of the point. In praising Spider-Man, I praise the spectacular Spider-Man. Josh Keaton, in my opinion, is in the top three voices of Spider-Man. He balances Spider-Man and Peter Parker perfectly, and that's one of the reasons why he was chosen. Josh Keaton can give us the heroic at the drop of a hat when we need it. He can give us the nervous little kid when we need that too, and everything in between. The entire cast is amazing, and the writers are amazing. The direction is fantastic. Greg Wiseman and Victor Cook both are outstanding, and Ben Diskin as Eddie Brock is fantastic, balancing both sweetness but being able to snap in a second. Who can forget James Arnold Taylor? And Vanessa Marshall as Mary Jane, who has this incredible tone of voice that sounds sweet yet sultry, which is perfect for the character? Who can forget Peter McNichol as Dr. Octopus, whose voice may have turned off viewers at first, but then became one of the most iconic Dr. Octopus voices ever? Check, please. Um, on the house, sir? How kind of you. And wise. Who can forget the incredible action sequences and brilliant score? Who can forget the damn theme song? The Spectacular Spider-Man is a series that exemplifies the best of what Spider-Man stories can be. And even though Peter is in high school and most of his comic book stories don't take place in high school, if the writers take advantage of the setting to further advance the story and pay attention to what makes Spider-Man Spider-Man, making him a person like you and me, struggling with the responsibilities of being a normal person with a normal life and yet having to hide his identity from those he loves to protect them from his enemies, then the writers will have crafted a truly great Spider-Man story. An easy way for Spider-Man to protect himself and his family from criminals is to use NordVPN. Awarded Best VPN and Best VPN Awards for 2019 by VPN Mentor, NordVPN protects your communications and personal data, allows you to visit whichever websites you want, whenever, wherever, and VPN security makes hacking near impossible. Have you ever wanted to watch a movie on Netflix like Uncut Gems, but was like, oh, <laughs> I don't live in the United Kingdom? Well, all you have to do is use NordVPN to set your IP address to the United Kingdom, and you're all set to watch Adam Sandler do his thing. To make it more authentic, well then you speak in a British accent then. And what else? It increases your broadband speed, so you can torrent safely. And hey, if you're like me and enjoy browsing the internet in a cafe where your information is out there in the open for anybody to steal, NordVPN is your shield to prevent that from happening. So maybe don't live on the edge and live as safe as you can. Get 70% off NordVPN, which is only $3.49 a month, and plus you get an additional month free when you go to nordvpn.com slash browntable and use coupon code Roundtable. The link is also in the description below. Thank you all very much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun to make, um, and it really gave me a lot of nostalgia for my childhood. I used to remember watching Spider-Man on TV and Saturday mornings, and then eventually it went to Spectacular Spider-Man when I got a little older. And that thing, that thing was a good show. And I still remember when it got canceled and Ultimate Spider-Man replaced it. And I was like, oh, it, I mean, you know, it kind of looks visually cool, Ultimate Spider-Man. And then I watched the first episode and it was all commercialized. Oh, Spider-Man and his spider gear and shield. I hate, I really don't like Spider-Man in a universe constantly. And this show gave that and that really bummed me out. Again, like what I said in the video, he's actually, he acts like an infant. And that was really frustrating to me, especially coming out of Spectacular Spider-Man. But Spectacular Spider-Man still holds a place in my heart. But anyway, I'm rambling. Thank you so much NordVPN for sponsoring this video. This video would not be possible without them. Thank you so much patrons for making this video possible. January and February have been a bit of a dry spell for me, but thanks to you 
guys. It really, really does help me a lot, and it keeps me afloat, so I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for coming to the table, and I'll see you all next time.